All right. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this webinar. Very excited for this topic. Uh, for anyone who follows my work knows that I love talking about interoception. I actually first started speaking about interoception um, three years ago when I was reading some fascial-based research by Robert Schleip, and I came across the term. And at that point, I had not heard of this word before, um, even though I'm so intrigued by concepts around sensory and sensory perception, uh, I still had not come across the word. So three years ago when I did, very excited um, about it and then started kind of diving down the rabbit hole of interoception and seeing that a lot of the research around this topic and this concept really sits within psychology, um, mental health, mental well-being, chronic pain, autoimmune conditions. So I would love to see more research within the fitness industry, um, athletic performance industries, the active aging industries, and how we can tie this concept to help our clients, our patients, and our athletes. So I hope that you find this very insightful. Um, we will be uh, reviewing some of the topics. And then if you want to dive in this topic even more, we have a three hour course, which I will be mentioning at the end. You most likely know who I am, but just real quick, my name is Dr. Splickle and I apply topics of uh, functional medicine, biopsychosocial interoception and sensory uh, perception and processing into my practice and then into education that I write through EBFA Global. And I'm so intrigued by sensory stimulation and perception that I developed Noboso, which is a sensory stimulating insole and mat company. So I, I love this quote when I was doing some of the research um, leading up to this webinar, it really kind of hits home what, what and how we want to start thinking about this. So one of the most relevant features of the world for a particular organism is the organism itself. So this means that we have this reality of who I am and your state, your internal state, your relationship to yourself. And then you use that to lay the foundation of how you interact with the external environment and how you interact with other beings. But that first identity with self is very important and is very foundational to emotional regulation and really uh, forward advances in humanity. So one big takeaway and really underlying concept when you look at interoception, emotional regulation, the nervous system, sensory processing, is that our nervous systems are shaped around the concept of survival. There is this foundational trend through our beings, through our physiology, through our emotional regulation, through everything that we do that is truly built around survival. We interact with, with each other so that we, we are not lonely in the sense of wanting to be social. The social leads to uh, procreational aspects of things. We need to regulate our internal environment because if our internal environment is not regulated, then we are not safe and that can threaten our survival. And then, of course, we have the external environment that we are relating to. So internal survival, internal survival is based around the concept of homeostasis and allostasis. Homeostasis, an example of that would be temperature regulation. So if your core body temperature starts to become too high, you start to sweat. Um, if it starts to drop, you shiver. That's a, a concept of homeostasis. And then we also want to maintain really a certain level of um, a basal heart rate, um, basal body temperature, our hormones, our fluid balances, all of those are related to homeostasis. But if we want to take this one step further as it relates to emotional concepts is that our state of homeostasis from a emotional perspective is based off of feeling 
uh, a calmness or harmony as well internally, which we'll go into, of course, because that is interoception. So homeostasis is going to refer to the body's ability to maintain a stable internal environment. As I mentioned, this is hormones, body temperature, water balance, etc. But it's also emotional. So please remember that maintaining homeostasis requires the body to continuously monitor and assess its internal conditions. So we are continuously doing this assessment. This is um, subconscious. We are not realizing that our body is doing this and regulating the temperature on a continuous basis, almost like a thermometer on a home. It's continuously regulating and reading the room. And then if the temperature happens to drop, either the heat or the air conditioner turns on, think the same thing. But also from an emotional perspective, we are continuously uh, assessing our internal state. This uh, internal assessment is oftentimes heightened or hyperactive in certain individuals, especially those with autoimmune conditions, um, those with anxiety or depression or post-traumatic stress, you, you become hyper uh, in a hyper aroused state or a hyper assessing state, which again is not where we want to be, but that is part of homeostasis. Now, the physiological homeostasis is different than emotional homeostasis. So please remember that there are two types of homeostasis that we are referring to. Now, allostasis, if you are familiar with this term, allostasis is the process of achieving stability or homeostasis. So if you notice that there is a shift in what you perceive as balanced, then there will be an action or a response by the body physiologically or emotionally that will then reset you into a homeostatic state. Let's say, for example, from an emotional perspective, is um, if, you, if you are someone who um, needs to feel control, again, this is kind of a, a far out example, but if you're someone who needs control, then if you are feeling like you are not in a controlled situation, which you are, you feel that based off of internal changes, you might feel like you're starting to get palpitations. So you're starting to get claustrophobic because you don't feel like you're in control. So what you sense is the increasing heart rate, maybe you start to sweat, your allostatic response emotionally is to get out of the situation. You leave the room, you flight, so you enter a fight or flight, but you enter the flight state, so you leave the room, so you are now back in control, and then as soon as you leave the room and you feel like you are back in control, now your heart rate slows, you start to stop sweating. That's how you were able to then re-achieve your homeostatic state, which is you feeling controlled. Yeah. Um, physiologically, obviously, this is happening as well. This is the HPA axis, autonomic nervous system, which is what I just spoke about, the fight or flight response, cytokines, um, etc. So allostasis is how you achieve homeostasis. Okay. Now, survival is based, remember, survival is really the foundation of our being, is based on sensory perception sensory perception, and then interpretation of that sensory input, both internally and externally. And then the purpose of that sensory perception and interpretation is to modify our movements, our memory, and our mood, which is really the nervous system. So when it comes to the sensory nerves, sensory nervous system, how we're bringing in excuse me, what we are going to perceive and interpret, we are bringing that in through sensory receptors. We are reading the sensory environment through exteroceptors, proprioceptors, and interoceptors. So exteroceptors, proprioceptors, and interoceptors. Those are the three types of sensory nerves that we are going to focus on. Uh, briefly, and then most of our focus is going to be, of course, on interoception and the interoceptors.
Exteroceptors we speak about a lot when it comes to barefoot training and Nervosa technology because a lot of this is from your cutaneous sensation. This is from the pressure, the two-point discrimination, the texture, temperature, itching. All of those are exteroceptive, your uh, perception to the external environment. Now, this is as opposed to proprioceptors, which are related to somatic. Somatic is movement and muscle. And these are receptors that are in the joint capsules and the muscle tendon junction, the Golgi tendons, the, the muscle spindles, those that are providing proprioceptive information that relates to movement, vibration, pos position, and equilibrium. And then finally, interoceptors mediate sensation from the viscera, visceral pain or visceral pressure or distension. So we have external environments, internal environments that still relate to our relation to, relationship to the external environment, such as movement, and then interoceptors, which is really the viscera and the gut aspect of our sensory input. Now, there's different types of nerves, sensory nerves. There's myelinated and free. Why I reference this is this actually has to do with the timing. So myelinated nerves, which when we think of the somatosensory system and you know our bicep contracting and things like that, that is coming from the myelinated nerves. These are typically A nerves, A alpha, A beta, A delta. And then this is opposed to free nerves. Free nerves here in the red, free nerves have no myelin sheath. So the myelin sheath is a fatty layer. Think of it like an insulation. And what is what it does is it allows for fast transmission of signal. So the timing of these different nerves you're going to see in a descending order is the more myelinated, the faster the signal is sent or processed to the central nervous system. Free nerves are actually a little bit slow, but there's a delay in them. Some of the free nerves that we will see are nociceptors, which are pain receptors, thermoceptors, and interoceptors. So your interoceptors are actually a form of free nerves or C nerves. So they're, they're referred as both. So if you ever see C fibers, towards the end of this lecture, we're going to speak about C fiber pain is different than A fiber pain. When you get a pain stimulus from an A fiber, it's actually going to be a faster response than a C fiber pain. You actually describe them different, which is really interesting for anyone who is um, fascinated with pain or um, treats a lot of clients or patients with pain, the psychology of pain, the physiology of pain. Just note that there's a difference between A fiber pain and C fiber pain. Now, interoceptors, oftentimes you will see that these are referred to as visceroceptors. Now, please know that that is actually not uh, fully accurate. Your interoceptors is not only from your viscera or your gut or the fascia that surrounds your organs. You also have interoceptors in um, some of the skin that we'll see, skin, hairy skin that relates with the external world. But for the most part, interoceptors we can think of them initially as visceroceptors. They're sensory receptors that receive stimuli from within the body. You will especially see these in the gut epithelia, other internal organs, and their fascial web. This can include the nociceptors, chemoceptors, so that's related to um, different hormones that are being transmitted, stretch receptors, again, that's in the gut lining. Now, visceral sensory fibers travel in the vagal nerve, vagal nerve, and have an autonomic nervous system function. If you remember autonomic nervous system, right, this is a fast, this is your initial stress response uh, when you are in a uh, uh, stressed situation. 80% of your vagal nerve is parasympathetic. So you will think of interoceptors. You want in your mind to associate this with vagus nerve. So interoception, vagal nerve, autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic. 
all of those have an a interrelationship with each other. We'll see towards the end that when you reference heart rate variability, heart rate, right, is a, uh, you sense heart rate. So when you sense changes in your heart rate, that is you sensing interceptors and a shift within those nerve endings. So interoceptors relationship to heart rate variability is an autonomic nervous system, vagal tone, vagus nerve parasympathetic response. If you remember from any prior lecture that I've given, when it comes to the autonomic nervous system, the side of the autonomic nervous system that's actually faster, the fastest, a lot of people think of it as sympathetic as fast, but it's actually parasympathetic. So we regulate our autonomic nervous system by the parasympathetic system. It is the break that we are on. And then when we kind of speed up our autonomic nervous system, we're essentially putting our foot off of the break. And then we go faster up into the sympathetic. And then to bring yourself back down to parasympathetic, you put your foot back on the break again. And that is the parasympathetic. So the, the muscle, I call it the muscle of the autonomic nervous system is vagus nerve. And that we will see is tied to interoception. So there's an evolutionarily preserved system, the interoceptive system that promotes gentle touch, which is an interoceptive response. That is the skin, right? Because it carries a social and emotional significance. Remember survival, what I said in the beginning, a big part of survival is that we have to interact with each other, partly because we want to procreate. That's part of survival, right? Is to carry on um, our genes, right? To oversimplify it, but that's really what it is, <laughs> okay? And just enjoy yourself along the way. All right, so interoception. So the butterflies in our stomach, that is an interoceptive system or response that we are perceiving. It is, a, is defined as a sense of this internal state. We feel a sensation in our body. We, we feel the butterflies. And then I'm going to interpret those butterflies. Do I interpret those butterflies as excitement? Or do I interpret those butterflies as fear? Everybody has their own barometer at which they interpret these sensations. So everybody's uh, internal homeostatic uh, scale or what they set as safe and stable and homeostatic is different. And where we establish where that um, barometer is or how that barometer is set is based off of prior initial um, experiences when we are, you know, from newborn to just a few years old. That stuff we go into much more detail in our three hour interoception course that I'll give you information towards the end. Okay. But these emotions that we have, the interpretation is the emotion, right? The emotion arises from the perception of that change in the body. So the emotion is, is deeply linked to interoception. Okay. So where do we find these interoceptors? We find them in our gut. We find them in the uh, fascia that connects the organ. That's the visceral fascia. You find them in the skin. So you will actually find interoceptors in the skin, in the myofascial web in general. We will have interoceptors. But it's really within the fascia. So we want to associate interoceptors as a fascial sensory nerve ending. It's a free nerve ending that is found in your fascia. Now, the ratio of nerves in the fascia is actually one to seven. So one, so the ratio is one to seven. One of the nerves has a somatosensory movement role. The seven, other end of the ratio, has a sensory role has an interoceptive uh, emotional role. So your fascia, I love this word here, the fascia is the organ of consciousness. It is continuously reading, sensing, perceiving, and interpreting, interpreting our internal state. 
you know, our fascia, it, it envelops, it interacts with, it permeates every single part of our being. You can break down the fascia into four main types of fascia. We have our superficial fascia, you have appendicular or axial fascia, you have meningeal fascia, and then you have visceral fascia. We're obviously focusing on the visceral fascia. And then within your visceral fascia, you have special nerves, proprioceptors, nociceptors, which is pain, and interoceptors. 70% of those nerves are going to be interoceptive, which again is emotion. Now, once you stimulate the fascial web, and you stimulate that fascial web, you get that interpretation. What happens is that it's going to be sent up into the central nervous system to a part of the limbic system that is called the insular cortex. So the insular cortex in your mind, <laughs> you want to think about your mind, that the part of the brain that processes emotion is the limbic system, part of that limb, limbic system that is uh, interoceptive is the insular cortex. And then the insular cortex, the stimulus goes into the anterior cingulate cortex. Now there's a posterior, there's a middle, there's an anterior of the insular cortex. The way that when you look at the research, it will often say that the posterior insular cortex is kind of like the sensory side of the semantic sensory cortex. Insular cortex is like the motor side of the cortex. So you have the sensory input that comes in, which is uh, you perceiving a shift in your internal balance. And then you it goes on posterior to the anterior, and then you give it the emotion in the anterior. And then the part that you give it in the anterior is a motivation element. So emotion and motivation are very interrelated as it um, comes to interoception, and that part of the brain is the anterior insular cortex. Now, what's interesting is that it's not just the insular cortex that is stimulated during interoceptive stimulation. You also will get activation of the This is a research that is speaking about the different pathways of interoceptive awareness and showing research demonstrating that it's not just a insular and a cingulate cortex. What does that mean? Interoceptive input is influencing larger motor movement patterns of ourselves, of our clients. So I like to kind of reference the importance of interoception being that there's this deep relationship between interoception and exteroception. That interoception, even though it's our internal states and we often think of it as emotionally related, that greatly influences motor output, movement coordination, um, you know, uh, motor athletes, fall reduction. Um, so it's really important to our clients as, as health and fitness professionals who deal with movement, you still have to think about the interoceptive processing of your clients, the patients, and the athletes. And this is why it's important to understand interoception, mood, memory, movement. What is the if they have anxiety, depression, panic attacks, PTSD, all of that is going to be deeply integrated to the autonomic nervous system, which again is interoceptive. Flight. That's going to greatly compromise their memory because the, the nervous system has the hierarchy of needs, right? And if if your nervous system is just trying to survive, it's not prioritizing the ability to remember, you know, uh, maybe 
uh, states or uh, phone number of someone, right? It's, it's trying to survive from like a basal need perspective. And then of course, movement, very important. So mood, memory, and movement is critical for every single one of our clients. So now when it comes to interoception, there's a few words that we want to think of. How do you assess this in your clients? So the way that we assess this in our clients, there's three main ways slash words or features of interoception that you want to think about. This is interoceptive sensitivity. There's interoceptive accuracy. And then there's interoceptive awareness. These Three different things have um, research around them. They have appropriateness in using the terminology. So we want to make sure that we are referencing it appropriately. So you want to think of this. Do you, do you notice a sensation? Asking yourself, do you notice a sensation? When you start to get a little bit of butterflies in your stomach, do you notice it? Do you understand that, sens that sensation? And can you manage that sensation? That is going to be the highest level of interoceptive processing is noticing it, understanding it, and of utmost importance is you manage it. So let's take a look. Interoceptive sensitivity. This is subjective. This is you saying if you think that you are interoceptively sensitive or not. It's a self-assessment. So this is measured through what's called a body perception questionnaire. When you go onto the Teachable platform, you will see a link to the body perception questionnaire. Um, if you're familiar with vagal theory, this is actually his work, the body perception. These are just a few of the questions. Um, do uh, you notice noises associated with digestion? Do you notice any swelling of body parts? Do you notice the urge to defecate? Do you notice muscle tension? Do you notice goosebumps? How about stomach and gut pains? Stomach distension, bloated, palm sweating, sweat on your forehead. There's a short one. There's a long version to this. And this is essentially you know pain uh, or these homeostatic that are happening in the body are you hyper aware of them or are you aware of them from a normal basis or do you not notice these changes? now this is as opposed to interoceptive accuracy interoceptive accuracy is the term that i referenced when i first started speaking about interoception and this to heartbeat detection. There's two main ways that you are essentially testing this. Heartbeat is what we're going to go over. Essentially, are listening to a uh, either like a metronome or something that is creating a sound and you are not touching your your pulse you're not touching any part of your body and you're essentially saying is my heartbeat matching what I'm hearing through the sound right and you're essentially say oh, okay that sound from the metronome is matching my heart rate that's your interoceptive accuracy. Yeah. Heartbeat tracking is going to be you essentially counting your heartbeats without touching any part of your body. So the way that you have clients do this, and we are going to do this soon, is that you are going to have them either lie in their back in samasana, they're going to sit in a chair with their palms up, so you don't want anything, no, no palms down touching, but your palms are up, you're in... Um, the chair, you could be in a lotus pose or anything like that, and your eyes are shut, palms are up, and then you are going to sense your heartbeat. You're going to count how many heartbeats you feel for 15 seconds, and then you will repeat this two times is what we'll do, and then you'll stay exactly as you are. You're going to take your index finger, and you're going to go over to your radial pulse, and you're going to feel your pulse or your heart rate, and you're going to count the, how many beats you feel, and then you're going to compare them. Depending on the accuracy, 
is going to give you a score of your interoceptive accuracy. Okay, so this is going to be heartbeat tracking. And again, this is what we're going to do. So I'm going to have you, if you don't mind joining me, I'm going to have you uh, lie on your back if you want, or you can stay seated in your chair. You could go into a lotus pose and you're going to shut your eyes, please. And when your eyes are shut, have the palms up, not palms down because your, your thumb has a pulse. Your eyes are shut and I want you to start to sense your heart beat. And what I'm going to do is tell you when to go. We're going to do this two times. 15 seconds, you're going to count your heartbeat and then stay exactly as you are. Take whichever hand you want and just go right over to the opposite hand, radial side by the thumb pulse. Find the pulse. Count for 15 seconds how many heartbeats you feel, and then we compare. Okay? We're getting ready and start. Stop. Stay exactly as you are. Right now you should be counting how many heartbeats you sense. One more time. Start. and stop. Beautiful. Stay exactly as you are. Take one hand over to the radial pulse on the opposite side. Find the heartbeat. And we're going to count again. Here we go. And start. And stop. One more, please. Start. And stop. Beautiful. Good. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to take those two numbers. You can average them out. Let's say you um, sensed 14 beats. And then when you put your hand to your, uh, to, to find your radio pulse, your heart rate was actually 16. Okay. So you have 14 divided by 16. I don't know what that is. Uh, we'll say 14 divided by 16. Okay. Okay. Almost an 88% accuracy. Okay. So now when you look at the research related to this, they say anything that is 80% or higher is considered a high interoceptive accuracy. Anything that is 60% or lower is a low interoceptive accuracy. Now, accuracy is different than sensitivity. You could have a high sensitivity and, or sorry, a, a high accuracy, but a low sensitivity, meaning that you don't quite feel the subtle changes. You were able to do this heartbeat track, but you don't notice a lot of these other, you know, when your palms are sweating and you're starting to flush. So just please remember that we're speaking about different things. Most of the research, when you look at it, will reference interoceptive accuracy over interoceptive sensitivity. Now let's go to the third one. The third one is called interoceptive awareness. This is where you could call this almost like a consciousness in a sense, right? This is where you are um, very aware, this metacognitive awareness of the interoceptive ability, a heightened ability to not just sense, but to then respond to or self-regulate the responses that you're perceiving. Um, 
which is very important, obviously, as you get into um, maybe certain mental health conditions or a high performing athlete that we will reference, um, having the ability to actually have that awareness and the ability to manage what you sense is very powerful. That's where I would take the next level of interoception. One, we need to just be able to perceive it, but then to actually navigate it is very important. And this is just breaking down the three of them for you, along with the research article, if you want to reference that. So now let's wrap up by making this uh, apply potentially to some of our clients or to situations where we may, we may find ourselves as coaches and movement specialists. So how can you apply this concept of interoception, your perception of your internal balance and homeostasis from an athletic performance perspective? Emotional regulation as an athlete is so important. The athlete, high performing elite athlete must be able to regulate their emotions. If you think from here, just these two sports that I had shown, gymnastics, aerials, Cirque du Soleil, high level, you know, acrobatic performing. I mean, these people's lives are at stake every time they are doing, uh, you know, a, a gymnastics release and some of these tumbling passes, they need to be able to uh, very much regulate their emotions. And a lot of that is built on their ability to sense um, and perceive, almost anticipate that they're going to have this response to the um, stressor they're about to put their body under. So the more that they can anticipate that stressor to their nervous system, the more that they can um, control it and call it stay in the zone if you want, right? So that they are able to achieve or accomplish these, these high performing tasks. Or you could think of this from the side of a um, sport where there's opponents. So now there's much less control in that situation. Um, if you are controlling the bar, the beam, your body, or the straps, that's one thing. If you are now playing soccer and you are having to navigate other, other opponents and a ball and you're running around, that is a very stressful situation where you are making very rapid decisions and doing very dynamic movements that if that starts to stress the nervous system and the athlete cannot control that uh, shift in their homeostasis because they cannot perceive that shift, that could greatly uh, increase their injury risk. So this is a study that I found looking at um, some of the changes that happened by integrating mindfulness training with elite athletes. And what they were looking at is could they use um, mindfulness, which was centered around really meditation and breathing practice. Um, and then through the meditation, the breathing practices, them understanding um, self, and I'll, I'll give you the name of the mindfulness program that they did, um, can that change their interoceptive accuracy and allow them to anticipate changes within their autonomic nervous system? So here, let's take a look. The interoceptive processing is critical for optimal performance. It links disturbances in the body's internal state caused by external stimuli. And then there's this goal-driven behavior that is aimed at restoring this homeostatic balance. What is key here is that there's a link between this internal state of homeostasis in the athlete and is caused by external stimuli, the opponents and the ball and the rest of the game that they're navigating, okay? And now this notion is consistent with findings that elite athletes are acutely aware of body signals and may more readily produce anticipatory prediction errors. This is a beautiful harmony of processing external sensory stimuli with 
internal sensory stimuli because really at the end of the day, everything that you're thinking of is, you know, the athlete is running around. They have to be controlling their heart rate and their breath, right? Like that's literally everything. They're controlling the heart rate and breath. Heart rate and breath are very much of these autonomic functions. So the more that we can optimize autonomic regulation in athletes is very important. That means autonomic nervous system is interoception, right? Interoceptors, they're sensing it. And then they are able to uh, control some of that autonomic nervous system through their interoceptive awareness, which one of the best ways to do that is mindfulness and self-awareness. So let's take a look even more. So this research study in, in particular, what they used as the stressor, what they used for the stressor in this research study was loaded uh, inspiratory breathing. So essentially they were just restricting the breathing. They were um, forcing the individual in a situation that would um, in some situations induce fear like they weren't able to breathe. So let's take a quick look here. So loaded inspiratory breathing has a sensory component of increased work to inhale. It affects uh, the individual by creating a mild discomfort and in some people an intense fear of the inability to breathe. So this goes right back to what we we're speaking of, right, is your breathing. So the breathing, your ability to, to breathe, the perception of that breath is the body sensation. And then your interpretation to that is really that link of the interoception. So some individuals would associate that breathing sensation with an emotion that is linked to fear because they can't breathe. So these characteristics make breathing an ideal experiment for the interoceptive system. In particular, we know it's in the insular cortex, okay? So now the M-peak training, this is what they did. So if you want to learn more about this, check out that research study, I cited it earlier, and then they did mindful performance enhancement awareness and knowledge training. So they were doing breath work, they were doing meditation, they were doing um, lectures on understanding self, um, moving away from ego, um, you know, the importance of, of oneness, of self, of reducing self-criticism. So it was a, it's a, a seven-week program that they went through. And then the resulted in changes. What they saw is it resulted in changes in the functional brain in response to the interoceptive challenge, which was the, the inspiratory breathing. And what they noticed was an increase in insular activation. So the, the breathing response, which stimulated the breathing, triggered where they process interoceptive information. And then if there was increased activation in the anterior insular cortex, that is typically associated with increased interoceptive awareness. Meditation and people who do a lot of meditation have increased anterior insular cortex activity. They are connected mind-body, mind-body through meditation. And it's showing that you saw those same changes in the athletes that did this M-peak training. And now what's interesting is that this is based off of previous research with elite adventure racers that demonstrated increased anticipatory insular activation during this interoceptive task. Um, now, just like when we think of exteroception and uh, muscle tuning theory and vibration and how we need to anticipate the ground. So before the, we hit the ground, we're actually loading through tension of our lower leg, right? It, it has to happen before the stimuli comes in or the stimuli comes in too soon. Same things here. These athletes are subconsciously, not on a conscious level, actually anticipating and responding to autonomic shifts within their body before it even happens, which means they are going to be one step ahead of that autonomic shift. That makes that athlete more in control of their body. Think of like Wim Hof, right? 
Wim Hof would be the epitome of interoceptive awareness and his ability to anticipate interoceptive shifts in his autonomic nervous system. Boom. That's it. We, he is a poster child of really what we're trying to do with these athletes through interoceptive training. And now let's look real quick at athletes and executive function. Is there a connection between interoception, autonomic nervous system, and the executive function? I'm sure you will say yes, there is. So there's an importance of physical abilities, motor coordination when it comes to sports, but there's a huge need for cognitive processing as well. Now, what's interesting is that research will show that cognitive, cognitive function tests will actually predict the success of ball sport players. So this is where we start to see that it's not just the the strength, the agility of the athlete that makes someone a good player. It is also their ability to be highly executive um, processors and the rate at which they can make decisions is happening very quickly. Their executive function is, again, almost on an anticipatory uh, state, which means they are anticipating what the opponent is doing before they even do it. That's what makes an elite athlete. So executive functions might be important for successful performance sports. This is especially in team sports requiring quick anticipation and adaptation to continuously changing situations in the field. Yes. So how can we, the question is, how can we train the executive functions in our athletes? Do we have them do um, brain training? Here's a research study. Do we have them do um, dual tasking? 100%. This is all that they're doing now within um, strength and conditioning and professional sports. Yes. But could we take it one step further and actually have them do interoceptive training? What is the role of increasing the interoceptive accuracy and interoceptive awareness in our athletes to then increase executive function? This is where we're looking at heart rate variability. Remember, heart rate variability is linked to vagal tone. And vagal tone is interoceptive. It is parasympathetic. So there's something that's called a vagal cognitive relationship. And this is the link between the autonomic nervous system and cognition. When you look at Stephen Porges in the polyvagal theory, he'll actually compare heart rate variability to these environmental transactions as, um, as it relates to social and affective factors. So if we can it can better control or better uh, influence heart rate variability through all various um, measures. Think of the first the first study that I gave through the M peak training. The result of those individuals, my guess, which would be another continued study, would be to do a heart rate variability test on them to see that as they did the MP training, did we start to see that they had an increase in insular cortex activity, but did they also start to have an increase in HRV variability, which means that they had higher vagal tone, which makes them more stress resilient. My guess is we're kind of comparing similar synonymous things. Now, last area that I want to reference, and then we'll take any questions that you have, is interoception and pain. This is not just specific to athletes, but this is what I mentioned in the beginning, just more food for thought, more stuff to digest, more um, uh, curiosity to be piqued. So now there are two main types of pain. There's what's referred to as fast pain and slow pain. Fast pain is going to be sharp, well-localized, pricking. Um, if you uh, go to the doctor and they say, can you describe the pain? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Right? A sharp pain is a fast pain. It is uh, uh, triggered by a delta, which is a myelinated fiber. So it is fast, it's myelinated. 
Now, this is as opposed to slow pain, which is often referenced as dull or uh, burning is another one. Um, and then this will be more of a C fiber type. This is a free nerve fiber type of pain. Now, how we can take this one step further as it relates to interoception is that everyone uh, interacts with pain differently. Everyone has different uh, pain tolerances. And a lot of our pain tolerance is built around our interoceptive sensitivity, where to be interoceptively sensitive, we've been speaking of a bunch of ways that it's positive, but there's some people who can be too sensitive, almost interoceptively hyper aware. It is referred to as an autonomic reactivity, which is often associated by trauma, um, uh, anxiety, PTSD. A lot of those individuals are in this hypersensitive interoceptive state, which makes them overly sensitive to pain. A lot of them will start to feel uh, almost like an allodynia pain where things that should not be painful are painful to them. That's almost as negative as being interoceptively disconnected and not filling your body, right? So we don't want to be on either side of the spectrum with just literally everything. We want to make sure that we have the perfect amount of interoceptive sensitivity. Now, um, this decreased tolerance to pain, like I said, is often seen in those that are hyper interoceptively sensitive. Mindfulness is one of the ways to reduce autonomic reactivity and a interoceptive hypersensitivity. Because again, that's, that's not safe from a survival perspective for that individual either their homeostasis system is uh, dysregulated as well. So please know that it's on, on both sides of the spectrum, in your clients and in patients, and we want to factor that in as well. So let's take a, a quick look at our, our recap here, and then I will take any questions that you may have. So... Going back to the beginning, here is our recap. Interoception, this is a type of sensory nerve. It is a free nerve. It's a C fiber nerve. And the interoceptors are typically found within our visceral fascia, within our viscera. And then when we uh, notice a shift in our internal balance, which is our interoception, we are essentially, essentially sensing a shift in our internal homeostasis that then sends a signal to the insular cortex. The insular cortex takes that sensory information and puts an emotion onto it that happens in the anterior insular cortex. And then that is our emotional projection of that perception or that shift within our internal balance. Now, a lot of people don't understand that process within themselves. So they don't understand the things that potentially, let's say, trigger them so that they can override them. That's where we start looking at the concept of interoceptive awareness. In addition to interoceptive awareness is interoceptive sensitivity and interoceptive accuracy. The one that's most often referenced in research is interoceptive accuracy. This is the heart beat tracking that is done. And then interoceptive sensitivity would be a questionnaire that is subjective. You can use all of these with your clients. Now, if we're trying to use this with our athletes or some of our clients, is those that are more interoceptively accurate and potentially interoceptively aware, could we see this as a way to become more anticipatory to shifts within our autonomic nervous system? which allows us to anticipate the shift and regulate it before it even happens. This increases our performance and decreases our injury rate. It increases our ability to executive, executively make decisions faster. 
and ultimately would help you in dual tasking. So the cognitive with the sensory processing at the same time. And then if we take this one last step towards our pain processing is understanding that we can also have those clients that are on the other side of the spectrum, that they are hyper interoceptively aware. And that's also a negative, could be potentially a negative because they have a heightened sensitivity to pain. We don't want to uh, continuously doing a self assessment of our state in a hypervigilant way because that will make you cuckoo and that will drive you crazy. That is anxiety, right? So that would be someone who is anxious. They're continuously checking and monitoring their internal state or balance. So as we go into our last slide, we have our three hour course that is on our Teachable platform. And what we are offering through the end of May is going to be $60 off of that course. So that is really 50% off of the course. This will allow you three additional hours into this topic. Please just head to ebfaglobal.teachable.com and that will allow you to get that three hour interoceptive course at 50% off. If you guys have any questions, we are going to go over that now. And if you would like this presentation, you may go to the EBFA Global teachable.com platform sign up for the course it will be free sitting on that school you just have to sign up you don't pay you just register for the free course and then if you don't want to go that way no problem you just email me at education at ebfafitness.com again education at ebfafitness.com and then i will send you the powerpoint now when you go into the EBFA Global Teachable School, you will find six incredible articles to give you even more information on this topic. So make sure that you go and sign up 50% off for the next two weeks to the end of May. Actually, I think that's a week and a half, sorry, week and a half. And then you will get many research articles that will dive down this rabbit hole even more.